we look after about 80% of the population, 84%, and the private sector looks after 16%. Looks after 16%. So when I told you that the public sector is in a mess, you shouldn't be too surprised. Because with 16% of the funds and 84% of the population, you'd have to work miracles to provide proper care. Now, I want to tell you that although we say that and I know it and I understand it, I'm the first one to complain that the government, this government, or my friends, and I work for many of the agencies, are still not doing enough for the funds they've got. I mean, they really, the public sector is awful in many spots. The Western Cape is the best I have seen, but certainly in the other provinces, there are such deficiencies that you'll be shocked. So, it's not an excuse because we don't have enough money. But the big thing is the inequity. And if you don't sort that out, <coughs> you're never going to solve many of the major problems. And certainly not, you won't solve NHI. You won't get national health insurance. Because if you don't have a good public sector, how are you going to, you're going to dra dragoon people into the clinics or hospitals? You've got to sort out the public sector. Motsuolet is a friend of mine. He qualified at our medical school. And he's very passionate about NHI. But I think people keep telling him that, you know, unless you sort that public sector out, it's not going to work. And I'm pretty sure about that. The next, I forgot <coughs> something here. But I was going to tell you, when you have these sorts of inequities, what's the meaning of it? The meaning of it is this that in the pub, uh, private sector they looked after say 280,000 HIV subjects, which is the worst epidemic to ever hit our country, the worst. And we've had millions of patients. In there. So they looked after 280,000 and the public sector looked after about 4 million HIV patients. So where did all this success in HIV prevention and control come from? It came from the public sector, not the private sector. No matter how well furnished they are, how well off they are, it came from there. And then the second thing was, I got this from Motsu Lady, so I forgot the figure here. But I think we are probably, you know, you people who work on TV know it's in the hundreds of thousands. We treat, treat hundreds of thousands of TV patients. He couldn't find a single one that was treated by the private sector. He's probably wrong, but the point is, there are huge disparity. And then lastly, this is the, the, the area of maternal and child health. In terms of deliveries, like the private sector looks after about 140,000 deliveries. We look after about, we meaning the public sector, look after a million deliveries. So that unequal distribution of funds means something in real life. It means life and death for some people. It means uh, survival for others and so on. So it's not merely a figure in abstract. It has real consequences. The, uh, so what's the solution? The so solution is, I'm not going to give you the details, but it needs a universal system, one system. Can it happen? The answer is yes. Is NHI one of them? The answer is yes. So are, are there successes? You don't have to look too far in the world. I lived for a long time in Britain. Britain had a very good national health system. I mean, it's been around from 1940s. And the people, whatever others might say, you know, South Africans usually come back, oh, they are long queues. Better have a long queue than no queue. And uh, that British system is good. It's, it's good in Thailand. It's good in Scandinavia. It's possible. And that's what we should aim for. And that's what this uh, graph is trying to say that you need an equitable system which is efficient with public funds and hardly any out-of-pocket funds. And that's, a, that's quite a slogan, no fees at the point of uh, delivery of service. The, you gathered from that 16%, the, the ones who go to private sector, they don't pay cash, they go through medical aids. The medical aids are useful, they are useful, but there are problems with medical aids because the biggest problem is uh, moral hazard, the first, first moral hazard. By that, what we mean is if you offer money 
for any service, you're likely to get some corruption of that service. So in this system, I'm sure you know for a fact it exists in everyone's experience. The doctors are often prescribing too much, costing too much, and people are abusing the system and buying whatever, telephones or cameras on a medical aid. So that is, that's the meaning of moral hazard, in, and it's particularly vicious in this country. It it's really works at the heart of the system. There are others also, supply side, demand, etc. And the fact that you have administrative costs. And you know, our, our biggest um, medical aid is uh, discovery. And medical aids are <coughs> supposed to be non-profit. I looked at this guy, Adrian Gore, who's uh, discovery. He's got a villa in France, he's got things in Paris, he's got New York. And you wonder how the hell did this guy make so much of profit? Well, it's very easy. They looked after the so-called non-profit medical health, medical aid, but then channeled it to this administrative cost, this one here, and channeled it there and are making millions and billions of rands. So this, if you have a medical aid for private health care, there's no reason why you shouldn't. There are many European countries and others which have fair systems have medical aid, but it has to be run properly, should be non-profit, and should be uh, directed at the population in the best possible way. I think I've already said this, and when I spoke about what uh, Jake had said, that the problems in the health system reflect the problems in our community. So the problems of race and gender and location and all of that and the violence, etc., are reflected in our health system. And if you, just to give an example about violence, you have to really think what it means when women can't go to the hospital and pregnant women can't be uh, left um, to themselves without being assaulted, when hospitals don't care properly, when queues are long, when there's no respect, even by nurses. I remember the days when we fought side by side with nurses for the freedom of our country. I don't see that anymore. I don't know what's happened, but there's been a total deterioration in the quality and the moral, the moral um, beliefs of both nurses and doctors. So, coming back to the main, what do I mean by fairness? It <coughs> needs to be defined. And I'm using a definition which is provided by uh, well-known people like Christopher Murray, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, Julio Frank. Uh, Julio Frank is uh, the dean at Harvard School of Public Health. He used to be the Minister of Health in Mexico. And uh, Christopher Murray is a, he's a very well-known writer about large global issues. So <coughs> their version is what I put up because I thought I needed to say that that the definition of fairness may vary considerably for different systems. <clears throat> Perhaps the market system, market, market system is okay for consumption goods. But for health, education, security, and some other systems, thank you very much. The concept of fairness in financial contribution may be very different. In other words, fairness is, I mean, for, for consumption goods, you can use market, the market system. You've got money, you buy it. If you don't have money, it's stuck. Whereas for health and for education, for security and some other systems, that doesn't work. You can't use the money, money as a root of uh, obtaining services. <clears throat> I'm also worried the way our schooling system goes. I mean, these public, uh, private schools are totally out of sync. The cost of these Private schools are now in the near millions. So it's also this idea of fairness runs across all sectors of our society. The next slide shows you <coughs> the same fairness, but as given by uh, Marie and Frank, the authors I've referred to. Basically, it says that for education, there's education here as a, uh, as a specific goal and education against the system that provides that. And you see that for education, you, it, 
education itself, activities and systems for education, help education. But in addition, other systems like the economic system, political system, etc., also affect education. And vice versa, if you look at anything, any of the others, health is also affected not only by uh, the health system, but many other systems too. The most important one I want to just show you is this last one, which is fairness in financial contribution. Fairness in financial. It occurs, occurs right across the board. It applies separate or in addition to all of these factors. So that fairness is critical for, uh, for proper health care. You would have gathered from what's going on in the US, Trump and his ban, but also in Europe. Uh, they had an election and nearly a very right-wing government nearly got into, the, into France. They are right, extreme right-wing people in the Far East, in the Philippines, for example. And I'm afraid uh, the land of my forefathers, India, has all, is also very right-wing, extremely right-wing. Modi is not what he seems to be. I mean, and uh, this move to the right has been global, global. And it occurred in the post-1970s world, and briefly, it deals with post-1970s economic and social policies, which are rooted in neoliberalism. I don't want to go into the details of that. I'm sure you've heard that. But the basic point, point in neoliberalism is that the state is a principal, role of state is principally, principally, only. The, the role of the state in health is important, but in this case, by this philosophy, it's principally to guarantee private property rights and proper functioning of market. Those are the two main aims, and they don't, that doesn't try, tie in with the provision of good health. And there's some examples of what neoliberalism means. It means as, well, as you have seen in the modern world, I told you 1% owns more than 99%. It didn't come by accident. It's a, a perpetuation of these neoliberal policies. It's an unconscionable capital accumulation all over the world, including South Africa. In South Africa, I don't want to give you too many examples, but I read the paper the other day, and these CEOs get 69,000 rands a day. <coughs> what do you have to do? I mean, I can be the most profound professor of medicine to can win a Nobel Prize. You don't want to get 69,000. In fact, I don't want it, I'm sure. Most doctors wouldn't want 69,000. But the CEOs are getting 69. So before they worry about um, taking more money from medical aids or whatever else in, in determining a national health service, they should stop this sort of obscene waste of money for CEOs, 69,000 a day. I don't know if you've read a book called, um, what is it called? It was written by a guy's name, I forget, but it was about thinking fast and slow. Thinking fast and slow. And he's a Nobel laureate. It looks like I'm only reading Nobel laureates because I trust what they say. But basically what he says is he didn't believe the story about the CEOs. He said, this is untrue. They can't be that worth 69. <laughs> He didn't use 69, but they can't be worth that sort of money. And he was an empirical scientist. So he did a study on good CEOs and bad CEOs. He took the best of the good CEOs. He said at the most, these characters made about a 30, 35% difference to a company. And yet they were getting so much of money. I'm sure all of, any of us working, doing anything, will make a difference greater than 35 to 40%. And so the question about CEOs is a major one for this country. And that's why you get this bizarre preoccupation with white, what's it, white monopoly capital. And when I first said that, I said, what the hell are these guys talking about? As if there are no black uh, uh, monopoly capital, they're a dime a dozen. And obviously it came from our dear friends in Bell, Pot Bell Pottinger, uh, the commercial firm, media firm in the UK, which was advising uh, the Guptas, <laughs> the inevitable creatures at the bottom of everything. You know, the old saying used to be there, there, 
There are too many chiefs and not enough Indians, and not the other way around. Too many Indians and not enough chiefs around. So these Indians are really doing a lot of damage. I apologize to the Indians. <laughs> Don't feel offended. We are not to blame. So, I told you about Amartya Sen. He was also, I was in the planning commission. He was a favorite of the planning commission. I think about 24 members. And basically, he says that, you know, you must think of the, of the world in terms of capabilities. What do people have to offer? And the capacity of people. And it's not to do with the size of the GDP. It's too crass uh, indicator of what uh, uh, development means. And it's from his book, Development as Human Freedom. And he's about the nicest economist to read. And not because he's Indian, I'm telling you that. It's because he's a real Nobel laureate worthy. They used to call him the Mother Teresa or economist. He hated that term. But uh, he enhances the real freedoms that people have. Uh, this is just a note to show you that health is not about hospitals and doctors and nurses and all of that. And there are things called the social determinants of health. And some of them are what you see here. And it is uh, things, excuse me, sorry. The slides have gone off here. So. It's, it's uh, immunization, it's water, it's sanitation, housing, and so on. And you will see that we've been making progress from about you can't see the 2000, 2000 to 2015. You can see almost in every indicator we're doing well as a, as a world as a world. So that if there are improvements in health, it will be due to that partly. The next slide shows you I was, uh, I was in the planning commission, and uh, Trevor Manuel, not Trevor the other one. Trevor Manuel was the chairperson of, and. Trevor, he never actually managed to summarize things. 28 people were, you know, all of them, egos the size of Mount Everest, and putting the, together their discussions, almost impossible, and Trevor wasn't smart enough to put it together. So you got a mix of what people said. But in the end, in the end, the, the report was fairly good, and I believed in many of the things it said and did, and one of the things it did was to consult very widely. I've never seen such community consultation ever and use the best technology we had and so on and so forth to ask people, what do you want? And people, all of us stood, served our time to answer those questions. But basically, it's to, if we are today here, it's not just economic growth, is that right? Not just economic growth. And it's not just social equity. It's somewhere in between, here, or somewhere here and here. You can't do one, and I'm, I apologize for this. So we have very smart uh, media people, <laughs> and you can see these are the features which result in a cycle of development towards the public good, and on one side you'll see the social cohesion, and then you'll see all these components here. You can see what they are because I can't read them, capabilities, opportunities, and so on. Those are the elements that we have to adjust in society to achieve an equal society. This one here is, uh, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but all the things we've been through, the Tabo and Becky denial of science, the Tabo and Becky denial, the current Guptas in the president, and the absolute corruption of the, of the president, of the cabinet, of the parliament, and of all the other structures associated with it, has <laughs> resulted in this decay and has contaminated the, and disgraced and compromised the beliefs and policy, policies of our government. It may have started with that first uh, corruption about, about the cause of HIV AIDS, whatever it was, it corrupted the whole system, I think, and therefore we think that the lasting co consequences of that initial flaw, and whether it was in Kandla or uh, the current uh, emails, etc., it has its roots 
in that past, which is much more recent. I'm just going to put up this because it's uh, the last few of my slides. I just love this guy. <laughs> he's, a, he's a playwright, Bertolt Brecht. I studied for a year in Bur Birmingham and I used to go to his plays a lot. But Bertolt Brecht said that, you know, famines are not caused by... Uh, famines, right? Famines do not simply occur. They occur because of the grain trade. I don't think it's exactly right today, but there's certainly a drought today which accounts for it. But what, what he's saying is that don't look at the surface of things. If the public health system is not working well, there are reasons underneath that. There are causes <laughs> of those, and those causes are often hidden from you. you. And he was trying to look at this. I want to end with this slide. And you must wonder, does anyone know what this means? <coughs> Who's been to Florence? They are literal people. Yeah? Travel, I've traveled people, at least. So if you go to Florence, this is not to show off that I know classical art or anything. It's just I happen to go to Florence. Couple. But in Florence, there's one, you know, that has got David, that fantastic statue. And when you go to that place, you have to go through a corridor. I must get back to this. Doesn't go around. Doesn't go forward. Either. Okay. So there's a corridor. I want you to see those statues. I can't do it without them. There's a corridor. Long corridor, just outside the, you know, that famous museum, Uffizi Museum. At the end of that corridor is the statue of David. Okay. Statue of David. You don't have to see all the slides again. <laughs> it's almost last. Just get it. Okay. So there's the statue of David. But along the way are these, uh, these, these statues in preparation. This one. You can see that? Oh. Thank heavens. But uh, it's this. Look at the ones from left to right. It's like this, this, uh, Angel, you can call it a creature, is emerging from that marble. Mm. And it's, it's emerging because Michelangelo is uh, crafting them, each block of marble. He had a lot of marble at that time, and he was crafting these, the David. And if you looked at it, it, it emerges from that. And finally you get the statue. And I feel the same way. We've got a long way to go. We really do, and our task is not easy. But like him, I also see the angel in the, <coughs> in the marble, and we need to carve until we set him free. It could be her or something. We set the, her or him free. I think it's a critical way of thinking about what we are going through, otherwise one would die of despair. Because you open the newspapers every day. Every day. They don't steal a, mil a million anymore, they steal billions. How, do, how did we end up this way? And I think we have to reassure ourselves that there are possibilities and we'll have to keep carving the granite of this uh, country to really release the angel that all of us are set free and our health service and system is set, uh, set free. But thank you very much for listening. Thank you. thank you so much, Professor Kavadia. I wonder if we, you covered so many things um, and really painted the overarching picture in terms of referencing many Nobel laureates but also reminding us some concrete facts and statistics in terms of the disparities, in terms of wealth and many other factors, health financing, going way beyond the speciality that you grew up in and in that sense really teaches us about broad thinking, um, so it's very inspiring. 
I wonder if we could take just a few minutes, if anyone has questions or comments, and we take a few minutes um, for the audience to rep reflect, or if there are any um, thoughts or disagreements. <laughs> <laughs> must be somebody who disagrees. Thank you. Uh, uh, allow me to uh, first congratulate you, uh, Professor. Oh, the surname and the name. <laughs> Don't worry. Surname and the Yeah. Allow me to congratulate you on. Uh, I think uh, you you did put forth uh, an incredible piece of work. Uh, uh, very educational. Very enlightening. Uh, uh, you've, you've touched up on uh, quite a number of issues, uh, which is actually uh, uh, very sensitive, uh, uh, very touchy, very disappointing uh, things that uh, the uh, South African government, that our government needs to uh, look at. Uh, I'm not disagreeing with you, uh, Professor. I, I, I just wanted to say that uh, I think we should also bear in mind that uh, to some extent uh, I think we should acknowledge that uh, irrespective of uh, the uh, problems that we are currently facing, I think first uh, we all also have to, even though to some extent, acknowledge the fact that uh, the South African government uh, since uh, 1994, have made some sort of a progress. Uh, and uh, I believe uh, that uh, we are still trying, the government is still trying. Uh, the thing what I'm trying to say is that uh, this is a young democracy, less than 30 years old. Uh, but uh, I, I also agree with you that uh, perhaps the uh, progress could have been made uh, we could have made much, uh, much more progress uh, if it wasn't uh, due to uh, certain aspects such as uh, corruption and uh, etc. Yeah. So uh, I just want to again uh, congratulate you. Thank you. No, thank you very much. I am not. You understand? I'm not against the government. Yeah. I'm against the. Lots of opportunities, my friend. We fought for a certain type of freedom. People gave up their lives. You know, I can't tell you what we've been through. I didn't suffer as much as many others. I didn't suffer the torture of this. You suffered all of that, hoping for this day to come. And many people have died. I personally attended the post-mortem of, uh, I'm sure you, you may not know this, these two people. There was Griffiths and Penge, who was a lawyer. And his wife, what was it? She was, um, I just forget it. Victoria. Victoria McKenge. And I attended their post mortems because the family didn't trust the forensic pathologist. They thought they'd cover up. Uh, Griffiths had his throat cut to the cervical spine. That's how bad it is. And I'm just telling you the sort of most immediate experiences I have had, but people have had much worse experience. So the reason we are all upset, you know, if, I was, if all of us were criminals, then we'd be clapping hands. But because we love this country, we love what we what, <coughs> excuse me, fought for, we feel betrayed. That's the problem. And we've got so, you know, we are not exactly Gabon. We've got some resources. We've got people. We've got educated people. We can do so much more. We can write books and we can build hospitals and we can build uh, residences and big, build houses for all. You build houses in KwaZulu Natal, they are collapsing because they gave the damn contract to some uh, one of their comrades. That's not the way to build a country. So it comes from the disappointment in our hearts. And I can tell you the guys who are making the village, they are not concerned, they couldn't give a hoot what's going on because it's not in their interest for us to get justice. So I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying why we feel as strongly as we do. 
And although my friend Macho Lady may be mistaken in some ways about uh, NHI, the man's got passion. You heard him speak. He speaks with passion. That AIDS conference we had in Durban now, from which I got some of the, the last talk, the last hour, the last speaker, last session, he kept that group alive of the people who were there because of the passion with which he speaks about many of the injustices in health. So that's, that's what I'm doing. There's a gentleman over here, and then we'll pass a colleague over here. So, my name is Ibrahim, and uh, let me just say, first of all, I, I've learned a lot, and I've actually enjoyed the presentation. I'm particularly uh, excited by the fact that you started off by talking about private ownership. Which, as far as I'm concerned, is at the center of many of the problems that we have. And I do think that often we, we tend, deliberately or unwittingly, uh, consider the fact that as we get socialized by patriarchy, we also get socialized by capitalism. Uh, that's the first point I want to make. But then I do think, uh, towards the end of your presentation, you said something about the, what I would regard as the political economy of South Africa, uh, which I might not entirely agree with. And I feel I have to share with you my thought. Please. And that is that I don't think that it is wrong in a country like ours to talk about white monopoly capital. Uh, I don't think that uh, you yourself uh, made reference to black consciousness. And I do think that, uh, yes, while there's monopoly capital everywhere in the world, but ours has always been racial capitalism. And it's practical. It's just obvious if you look into the South African economy, it's no sector where there are not monopolies that are predominantly white controlling the economy. I don't think we're anywhere near black monopoly capital. And uh, the second thing I think linked to that is that it's interesting. Yes, I don't disagree with the fact that Bell Pottinger, for whatever purposes, might have used uh, the term but they were definitely not the first he, uh, to introduce that to the South African political uh, lexicon. And, um, and so I just thought I wanted to share those two. No, thanks very much. I mean, I'm sure many other people you know, feel the same thing. It's just my worry about using words loosely. You know, when you say white monopoly capital, the implication there's no blacks. That's just not true. It's the same thing about my feeling. I'm sure many people will disagree. They said that blacks can't be racist. You know, I can't believe these things. And I'm not uh, like the DA Lane, who, uh, what's her name? Who said that uh, cap, uh, colonialism wasn't so bad. Or what it, she didn't say that. But anyway, I'm not, I'm not implying that. I'm just saying, I try to work as a scientist. It's difficult, but I try to work. And so the, everything must be proven. You can't just say white monopoly capital, other than the Bell Pottinger thing that cost a billion rands or something to devise. It's just that it's incorrect. There are black capital. Otherwise you'll think there's no black capitalists. No black capital. There are white capitalists, black capitalists, all sorts of colors. It's got nothing to do with that. You go to India, my forefathers come from one of the most capitalist countries you can find. You go to the US, well, the less said about that, the better. But I remember the, there's a cartoon uh, which shows this guy called Rupert, eh? our tobacco man, tobacco man. And I remember him writing in the papers that he, workers should get educated, black workers, because they can't pay them more because they're not educated. And I thought, who the hell is this guy? He's been selling tobacco and endangering millions of lives. He's been a capitalist and he's been underpaid people. And this is what he says. And the cartoon actually say, shows him with a huge bag of, of money, uh, uh, accumulation from apartheid, and he's looking into the mirror at Bell Pottinger. He says, you capitalists, you're uh, looting our country, South Africa, which is a paradox, because he's, he's done the same. So I'm, I'm not quite sure what I was saying, but anyway, <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? 
I also get worked up like what's the name? Anyway, I agree with what you are. It's difficult. Um, one last question or comment from the... Uh, I'm Demoris Kiewitzen. I'm... I think I first want to salute the veteran whose lecture this is actually about. Um, because I think um, Professor Sa Saunders, I, I can still remember Alphen Civic Centre Prof, where you had your first go at me, and that is where I learned my lesson, that data must be cleaned up and used in a manner to shift policy. Now I like what you said, but what I, I, I see missing in your presentation or in your lecture is the passion this guy had for communities. And I think we all need to take responsibility for the mess the country is in and not shift the blame. Because if we continuously shift the blame, we're never going to fix the problems of the country. We have a constitutional obligation, and that is our responsibility to hold accountable the very government in the Western Cape that drives the healthcare service. If you look at the 2030 plan of the department, my question today was, so where's the community voice? Yes. It is on the pavement, in the street, and we want to take on the government. And I think the lesson I'm walking away from, the life and memory of the veteran of public health, is that you need to keep your stats to hold the state to account. And we as citizens, if we have our facts together, we can change the tide in this country. And I'm actually sorry he didn't ask me to do the lecture because I would have given him his own history lesson that he gave me 25 years ago. And that is, remember that if you want to raise an argument, have your facts together. So I'm not sure. <laughs> but can I just tell you one thing? So you don't know me well enough. <laughs> Building community organizations is in my bone, my friend. You go and look today who's doing the work in uh, Kuala.